my brothers and sisters in Christ, on this most holy morning in which Jesus Christ passed over from death to life, we gather as the church to watch and pray. The light of Christ rises in glory, overcoming the darkness of sin and death. As you're able, please stand for the call to worship. It is the day of resurrection. Rejoice and be glad. Our sin has been forgiven. Light has overcome the darkness. Jesus Christ is risen today. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.
Please remain standing and join with me in the gathering prayer. O oh God of all our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts that we might experience you anew. Open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast, liberating love to all people, everywhere. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share now in signs of reconciliation and peace. So I would like to invite all the children to come up here with me this morning. I was telling everybody at 845, Easter is my favorite Sunday because I love seeing everybody all dressed up. Hello, everybody. So... Can you guys see what it is Taylor has in this basket? If you can't see, turn around and look on the screen up there. Anybody know what those are? M&M's. Anybody get M&M's in their Easter basket this morning? Yeah? Yeah? Well, these and these are special Easter M&M's. Do you know what makes them special? You do? Okay, I have a poem for you guys to read. So this looks like the M on an M&M, &M, right? Okay, remember this. Look up there. So, the sweet truth of Easter. These candies tell a story. The best news you'll ever hear. It's about Jesus dying on a cross so that we could be brought near. So hold them and turn them and you will see the M becomes a W an E women an E or a 3 I keep doing that backwards So the E stands for Easter God's everlasting love and eternal plan It reminds us of God's resurrection of sinful man. The three, is that right? 
The three represents three days Jesus spent in the grave. By his death, his children he saved. The M reminds us of mercy of the Messiah showed as he died in our place. And the miracle of resurrection so we can see him face to face. The W reminds us that he alone is worthy of our worship and praise and calls us to be witnesses around the world for all days. Happy Easter, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Let's go upstairs. Thank you, Ashley, and it's good to see all those pretty dresses and guys all dressed up today. Happy Easter to all of you. And I'm glad you've chosen to join with us in worship here at Christ Church today. Those of you here in the centrum, those of you joining us online or on the radio. If you're joining us online or on the radio, we always invite you to go to our website at ccumwv.org. And there you can download a copy of our bulletin and join with us in all of our liturgies and songs that we'll be sharing today. As we gather as a community on this glorious day of Easter, we come together as a people of hope and as a people of prayer. And so as we prepare to join in our time of prayer, I lie on the altar table, the prayer concerns, those of you who've written as you came into the centrum. If you're joining us online and wish to share a prayer concern, you can place it in our chat feature on Facebook or through our webpage. And we know that there are some in our community today who are gathered with us whose hearts are heavy having lost loved ones. But on this day in which we celebrate Easter, we know that that pain is at least mitigated a little bit in knowing that our loved ones live on in glory. So now, my sisters and brothers, let us prepare our heart for prayer as we light the prayer candle and sing the chorus. Holy God of resurrection and life, come and fill your people this day with your peace. Fill us with your power, fill us with your strength. Empower us to be your witnesses in this world to that glorious miracle of resurrection. For Lord, we come as a, a resurrection people, those who seek to follow the ways of your Son, the Christ, the one who taught us, the one who gave his life for us, and the one who on this day flew open the tomb, demonstrating forever that love is the power that rules the world, and that it is only love that can overcome the struggles of this life, and that it is through your love that death is defeated. It is through your love that sin is defeated. 
and that it is through your love that peace may come. As we gather as your resurrected, resurrection people, we, we pray that that love would come and that love would empower us and strengthen us. We pray that that love would surround those who we love who are walking that journey of loss and sorrow. We pray that, that that love would strengthen all who are struggling with illness, be it of body, mind, or spirit. We pray that that love would come leading this world to peace, such that your glorious power of resurrection might be known and that all people might live as sisters and brothers in your love. We ask these things on this Easter Sunday, celebrating your power of resurrection as we share the prayer that our risen Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. God indeed makes all things new. Our New Testament lesson on this Easter morning comes to us from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. It's the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 11. Now, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, otherwise known as Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of our gospel lesson. <clears throat> our gospel lesson today comes to us from the gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> Loving and gracious God, let us pray. As we gather today, O oh God, in this your house and celebrate this glorious day of resurrection, I pray as always that the simple words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that these things would be acceptable in your sight. For you ever and always are our rock, our redeemer, our resurrection Lord. Amen. You know, we often think about how there are kind of two people uh, in this world, or two types of people. There are what we often call the full people and the empty people. Sometimes we call them pessimists or optimists. Cup half full versus cup half empty kind of people. And if one were to take a poll of us today, I'm sure if we'd ask, would you rather be full or empty, most of us would probably say full, right? Because, well, 
full is good. As people living the most fruitful and economically blessed nation on earth, most of us, when we look at our lives, they'll see that we are people who are full. We feel pretty complete. And as people living in this most fruitful and economically blessed nation, we feel that way. But what about a full cemetery? Well, on March 2008, the mayor of the village of Sarper Inks in southwest France threatened his residents with severe punishment if they die. And the reason was the town cemetery is full and there's no place left to bury them. And so Mayor Gerard Lalonde arranged for the governing council to, to pass a resolution regarding this, which read in part, All persons not having applied in the cemetery and wishing to be buried in Charpenot are forbidden from dying in the parish. Offenders will be severely punished. Now, I'm not sure how he went about punishing them, okay? But he was concerned because the cemetery was full. Now, the problem our disciples faced on Easter morning, though, was the exact opposite. For you see, the tomb was not full, it was empty. And when confronted with this mystery of Easter, when confronted with this mystery of the empty tomb, they came up short, and often we do too. We feel incomplete because this mystery is just too hard for us to understand. I'm sure. Sure, that was the reaction of the women. At least that's the way Mark remembers the story. Now, most scholars know that Mark is, of course, we recognize it as our first gospel in some of the oldest and earliest versions of this gospel, those ancient papyri. The text stops right where I did. And all of those additions to the book are considered later editions. There's a short ending, there's a, there's a longer ending, but those very early documents started right, stopped right at verse 8. And regardless of how we might feel about critical analysis of Scripture, the fact is verse 8 does not make much sense, particularly when we know about the other Gospels. I mean, the Gospel of Mary, I mean, the Gospel of John has Mary seeing Jesus right there at the tomb. And or the excited disciples fall over each other and then they worship at Jesus' feet in Matthew. And then we have Peter who looks at the tomb and then runs amazed in the Gospel of Luke. Those are the ways we remember the resurrection. They're complete. They're full. But Mark, Mark simply says they fled for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. They said nothing to anyone. Why would these women not tell anyone? I mean, they were faithful disciples. They had made their way to the tomb. They they came in the darkness right before the dawn to anoint their master. They were good disciples, good devout women. They were doing what any disciple would do for their master who was deceased. They come with the the oils, the spices, and the balms to anoint the body. And as they do, they come wondering who will get them in to where the body lies. For, For the stone was too big, they said. I believe that the stone of grief on their hearts was even bigger. Bigger than any rock at the door. Because they had watched their Lord die a horrifying death. And the men... That inner circle of Jesus' disciples, they'd all run away. And they were now in hiding. Yet these women come anyway. And when they do, they encounter a miraculous and mysterious scene. For when they get there, the stone has been rolled to the side, exposing an empty slab where they had lain Jesus' body. And there's a man sitting on it. An angel of the Lord who says, don't be scared. You're looking for Jesus. He's risen. Tell Peter and the others, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him like he said you would. And then they fled in fear and didn't say a thing. Now, I imagine most of us can identify with these women. For that reaction the women showed at the tomb is often the same reaction we have when we're faced with the mystery of death. 
Our most common reaction is silence. We just simply do not know what to say. It just doesn't seem possible to come up with the right words when someone dies. And so we tend to say nothing at all. These women were the same. They they were stunned into silence. But we know that in the end, they could not not say anything, right? We know they said something. We, We know they shared what they discovered in the dawn's early light with the other disciples. We know they did what the angel instructed. We know they said something or we wouldn't be here today. So the question is, why? would Mark end his gospel like that? Why would he leave an empty ending? Well, I believe that Mark in these earliest renderings of the good news of Jesus Christ wanted his disciples and all who heard it to remember something very, very important. Something he wanted them to remember in this story of Christ's wondrous resurrection. Something he wanted them to remember that this ultimate defeat of death through the power of God is actually unfinished. It's incomplete. And it's incomplete if we just leave it as some story in the past. Oh, this is a cool story written 2,000 years ago. Isn't it nice? Jesus died and rose again on the third day and some women saw him and his disciples. It's a nice story. Let's move on. But just as those early hearers of Mark words knew, those women and those women were not silent. And Mark's reminding them and reminding us that we're not supposed to be silent either. For you see, the work and power of the resurrection is unfinished unless we write the ending. It's empty unless we become part of the story. And the fact is, all of us gathered here and online, all of us are part of the story. And God's redemptive purposes for the world will prevail only through us who are willing to embrace that mystery and work to its fulfillment here on earth. And Mark knew that. And as he retold the tale of this most wondrous story ever told, how Jesus rose from the grave, he wanted us to remember. He wanted us to remember that no matter how startling the news seems to be, no matter how far-fetched it seems to be, no matter how stunned we may feel, it's true. The tomb is empty. And like those women, we're the ones to tell the world about it, telling people everywhere that God has defeated death once and for all, and that God has destroyed evil's stronghold. And that those gates of hell have been rent asunder and that our Lord lives. As James White, the pastor of St. Giles Presbyterian Church in North Carolina, told his congregation one Sunday. It's not at the grave that the gospel writers encourage readers to find the resurrected Lord. For you see, in every account of finding the resurrected Jesus, Jesus is found in places other than the grave. Mark is just the one that's the most straightforward. For you see, there's no resurrection appearance of Jesus at the tomb in Mark. It's just empty. And the disciples are told to go to Galilee. And just what or where is Galilee? Well, if we'll remember, Galilee is the home of these disciples. It's the place where they lived and worked. So Mark is reminding them and he's telling us that the living Lord isn't at the tomb. Jesus is out there waiting to meet us where we live and work. For you see, the the resurrection isn't just some story from the distant past. The empty tomb tells us our Lord has gone on ahead of us and he's here to meet us right here in Charleston. He's there with the nurses and doctors over at CAMC over here and on the other side of the river. He's with all the tellers and the office workers who will be going to the banks and the buildings downtown tomorrow morning. Because the room is empty, he shows up at McDonald's. He shows up at Fife Street. He'll, He'll show up at Soho's if you go there for brunch. 
If you see our Lord now walks the halls of GW, Charleston High, Charleston Catholic. He's in all of our schools. He's risen. So now he can be at Edgewood Summit and Charleston Gardens. He can be over there with our unsheltered sisters and brothers at Sojourners and Covenant House. Jesus has left the tomb. It's empty. He's gone on to Galilee. He's gone to the places we are. He's gone to the places we live. For you see, the tomb is empty, and in its emptiness, we find the fulfillment of God's promises. As some others have written, Christian faith simply claims that while we may die physically, our hope in such times is is not simply the power of the human soul to survive death, but in the power of God to give life where there is death. The power of God to give life where there is death. For you see, the promise of the resurrection is that death cannot win. The tomb is empty, and because it's empty, death has no power over us anymore. And the power of the empty tomb is about experiencing and releasing that power of resurrection life in the midst of our difficulties and darkness. Where we see struggle and heartache that comes with addictions and illness. Because the tomb is empty, we know God can rehabilitate and renew and rejuvenate and heal. And where we look around and we see poverty and anguish, because the tomb is empty, we know God can change comfort and convert it. And where sadness and sorrow exist, we know there is life and hope. Where there is loss, there is renewal, and most importantly, where there is death, there is eternal life. A promise which is stunning in its mystery, but one I believe compels us to speak, to shout, to exclaim and proclaim to all the world. Those women who were at first silenced in their fear and shock and surprise become the first to proclaim the good news. And because of their loving perseverance and courage, these women are rewarded with the honor of being entrusted with the most important news the world has ever heard. These women and many women who have come after them can be rightly called history's midwives of hope. And they come before us, I believe, on this resurrection morning of Easter as an example to us from the story of what we are called to be. Because you see, my sisters and brothers, all of us are called to be midwives of hope. And what does it mean to be a midwife of hope? You know, the word hope is often used in ways that are mystical or rhetorical or perhaps so religious that the meaning escapes the world. And somehow it, it escapes the reality in which we have to live. Thinking that hope is a, is a feeling or a mood or an inspired moment that's lived somehow above the, the painful and dull agonies of history. We're down here living in it all and some was, somebody says, well, you have to have hope. And right away we begin to think, oh, I'm supposed to feel something I'm not feeling. To get in a mood that's just not natural for me. I need to rise above the daily reality somehow and and be hopeful. As I read those words from Jim Wallace, I began wrestling with this thing called hope. And more and more I'm convinced that we must see hope in a different and I would say a more biblical way. For you see, hope is not simply a feeling or a mood or a word used in a rhetorical flourish. Rather, hope is a choice. Hope is a decision. Hope is an action based on faith. And hope is the dynamic of history. Hope is the engine of change. Hope is the energy of transformation. For you see, hope is the door from one reality to another. And the resurrection is that door to hope. And Jesus showed us that the resurrection comes by way of the cross. There is suffering and hope because they're joined together. 
but we have to move from one to the other. And the only way we can move there is go through that door of hope. And that empty tomb is the door. For you see, Jesus' tomb is empty. Even if some archaeologist discovers something years from now, they keep trying to disprove it. But they haven't found any hard evidence. Because the greatest and most wondrous mystery of the risen Lord isn't found in rock tombs. It's not, it's not found in burial clothes. But rather it is found in people. People like you and me. People who are changed by its power. That ragtag band of scallywags who were running and hiding finally caught the vision. And they heaved together that immovable wall called the Roman Empire. And they watched it collapse in a heap before this mystery of love. Could they have done so if the resurrection was just an idle tale? These two common, ordinary people, would they risk life and limb for a lie? Why would Peter persevere until he was hung upside down on a cross? Or Paul, who wrote that wondrous letter to the church in Corinth, would go and lay down his head on an executioner's block. My sisters and brothers, they did it because the tomb is empty. And in its emptiness, they found the power to survive. And they found the power to literally change the world. And so Mark reminds us this morning that this Easter story is an unfinished one. In a garden cemetery in Judea many centuries ago, God acted. And God acted in an inexplicable, uncontrollable, unpredictable way. As he once and for all time defeated the enemy of death and destruction. He rolled away that stone and he emptied out all the dead places in our lives. For in that moment God let Jesus loose. Letting him loose to wander ahead of us. To go to all of the Galilees of our ordinary days of living. And God left this story unfinished intentionally. Because he was counting on us. Counting on us to catch that story. To make it our own. And to live in its light. In our day and time. Until all can know that good news. That wondrous news that all are meant to share. And that being that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Will you say it with me? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. And now as we celebrate that promise, and I catch my breath, let us share in our tithes and our offerings.
now, my sisters and brothers, go forth as God's chosen witnesses to proclaim all you have heard and seen and experienced. We go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Next slide. Go forth sustained by God's steadfast love. We go forth transformed and transforming. Go forth with shouts of joy. Christ is risen indeed. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.